Hey, Salvador Braven here. Welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. Got a killer episode for you today. A camera bag that was incredibly successful on a Kickstarter campaign. This is the top shelf camera bag Kickstarter. You know, not only did this campaign like do super well, they're in Indiegogo, they raised over a million dollars, like super good, right? I also wanted to kind of get into like more than 3,600 backers. I also want to ask you a question. So I wanted to start today's podcast with a question which you can kind of answer to yourself silently or you can write it down if you want to. I think this question is really important. And that question is, what is holding you back? What is holding you back from experiencing success? What is holding you back right now as it relates to the product? And let's be honest, like you're, you're already seeking out education. You're already listening to podcasts. You're already doing the things that are incredible to do to try to figure stuff out. But at the end of the day, what is really holding you back? I think it's important to ask that because when we ask that question, it allows us to identify the next step, the next thing that we got to do. So often in life, there's so many things that are trying to command our attention. There's so many things that are you're pulling our attention, right? In many different areas, but it's kind of like dominoes. You got to lay one domino, then the next, then the next, and then they can all, you know, fall down in a line perfectly as you envisioned it. But if you try to set them all up at once, it can kind of be a little bit difficult and you might accidentally, you know, have the whole domino chain go early and it's just not going to work out very well. You got to focus on what is next, what is holding you back right now. So keep that in mind. I'm going to follow up with you on that question at the end of today's podcast. The other thing I want to really quick mention is, you know, this is your first time listening. I do a ton of these episodes in order to just kind of share what's working. It's very no nonsense. I'm not asking super, you know, special questions. I'm just kind of asking like, how'd you get funding, man? How'd you get backers? I'm just, you know, trying to deliver the real deal to you so that you can go out there and you can execute on this information and this knowledge and these teachings and this education. And also as well for me to keep my fingers on the pulse as a marketer in this industry, right? To kind of help myself in a self-serving way, I guess, in that way. But the great things in life happen when we go outside of our comfort zone, right? We only grow when we're going outside of our comfort zone and you're already experiencing that. The second we get outside of our comfort zone, it's like, ah, it's a little bit scary, right? And a little bit anxiety producing and uncertain, right? So we seek out people who can help us and we seek out what do we need in order to have success? What are the ingredients, right? So today, hopefully by, by listening to today's podcast episode, you'll walk away with a heck of a lot of great proven tactics that can get you funding, learn how these guys did it, and hopefully be a tiny bit inspired for your own journey. And we'll follow up with my question for you today at the end of the podcast. Finally, my last my last announcement, if you want to get in touch with me, just go to crowdcrux.com. My link, C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X.com, crowdcrux.com. Go to that link and you can get in touch with me there if you ever have any questions you want to reach out or something like that. Can't guarantee I'll reply to you, you know, in 24 hours or anything like that. I get a lot of emails, but I will do my best to, to answer you. And if I don't, just be, you know, be persistent and I'm, I'm sure I'll, I'll see your, your email there. Thank you so much for listening to the show. The podcast episode is coming up right after this. This podcast episode is sponsored by The Gadget Flow. The Gadget Flow reaches over 28 million people and they've been around since 2012. They're Indiegogo and Kickstarter experts. They featured over 5,000 crowdfunding campaigns. And if you have a technology or design campaign, it is a great platform to generate awareness and get backers. You can check them out at thegadgetflow.com slash submit and list your project today. Hey guys, welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified podcast. Today we have a six-figure Kickstarter campaigner on the show, actually two of them. They've so far raised over $600,000 for the top shelf, super fast, all access camera bag with more than 2,400 backers, a massive feat. And we have Matt and Nicole on the line who are a brother-sister duo and also photographers. Guys, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you. <laughs> It'd be great if we could you could kind of get started just in terms of what your different roles were here. Maybe we can start with Nicole there. What was your role with the Kickstarter? I'll just start by saying that Matt is really the brains behind the top shelf. You know, it was his idea. He prototyped it. He did such a great job. My role was really to 
like I hired the marketing firm. We're working with Launch Boom, who has been just fantastic through this whole process. And we've both been working with them, obviously, but it was sort of up to me at the beginning to to find which marketing firm because there's a ton out there. So we really had to like sift through that. And then it's just been ongoing with the campaign and we've really been tackling it together, both Matt and I. But it's definitely like an ongoing thing every day. It's lots of answering of emails and comments and, you know, we're running ads. So there's comments there. And so kind of the managing the, the aspect of the campaign there. Yeah. 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 When it, when it comes to you, Matt, it sounds like you did a lot of the product development here. How did you come up with the idea for the product? And can you share just a little bit of it with listeners? Long story short. Yeah, I was a photographer for years. And the camera bag, like the current camera bags, I had about probably six bags. And that's really common. Like photographers will have like between four and 10 bags because, you know, they only work for kind of one thing, not everything. And like, especially when I was doing wedding photography, I'd have like, I'd get actual anxiety days leading up to weddings because I'm like, I'm going to be missing shots all day because I can't get to my memory card quick enough, switch a lens quick enough, like switch blah, 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 this, this, and this. And you don't know when you're going to have to like change your stuff because you can't predict what kind of photo opportunities are going to be coming up. Yeah, yeah. And even if you have an assistant standing there handing you everything that you need lightning quick, they still need to get into their bag really quick. Like the fastest bags on the market are essentially your standard shoulder bag sling bags. And they're great because they sling from your back to your front lightning quick, but they're really skinny and compact. And that means that your gear is buried under three different levels. Mm. So you have to take stuff out to get to your other stuff down below. Yeah. And you might miss a shot in that, that span of time too. Yeah. And you will. And that's what I had anxiety about. I would always be missing shots. And even if you do have the time, to do whatever and like the bride and the groom the whole family is standing there you know they don't want to wait for you and your slow camera bag yeah but yeah the the big thing was when you would actually lose shots and you can't ask for those moments to happen again in photography had you ever created a product before or designed a product before in my mind yes (laughs) (laughs) but in actuality no not at all But yeah, it's really natural for me to like think of like, especially anything mechanical. Like I love, it's like therapy for me, just like daydreaming and thinking of mechanical benefits and like, you know, especially ways to simplify things. That just like really, really tickles my mind. So with so many ideas that you have going through your head, is there any reason why this one kind of stuck and the reason why you involved your sister in, in the project there? Well, yeah, it was a perfect storm because, you know, I'm a photographer and there was a huge issue that I was thinking of for years that had to be solved. So it was just kind of a perfect storm of like all those things coming together. You're the and best then, yeah, customer, my sister, yeah. she, she really underplayed herself when she was describing <laughs> herself, but she's really good at being in business meetings and, you know, managing like we have maybe f- what five different teams of people. And there's just hunt, like thousands and thousands of emails and like having all those logistics sorted out and like my mind doesn't oh, thanks, work. Matt. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, so Matt's, Matt's a creative and I, I sort of overtake all the business side of and things. And everything would completely collapse if it, yeah, it wasn't for Nicole doing all that stuff in the behind the scenes, you know. I'm sure that Matt came to you with many different ideas over the years, right? Is there a reason why you think you really persisted on this one? Was it something that stuck out to you? Again, without going too much into our backstory, because there is a backstory there, and I know we only have 30 or 45 minutes here. <laughs> um, but Matt started on this project really back in 2011. He patented it back then. And it's just been a work in progress since then. And from 10 years ago, I knew that we had something here, you know, something that was going to be really great. and. I wasn't always involved there at the beginning stages because a lot of it was, you know, building it out. He started with, you know, drawings and then started building the bag out of cardboard and then it turned into plastic. And then, you know, it's to the Philippines to work with designers there and spent a year in Vietnam and more recently and that sort of thing. I knew I would always be involved somehow, for sure. 
and yeah, and here we are. Here we are today. Yeah, in the first couple of years, I had two other business partners and an investor, and that that went south real quick. But at that point, I I purposely didn't want to involve Nicole because I I in my mind I was like I want to become successful on my own and not want to have to rely on my big sister. Kind of like an <laughs> ego thing. <laughs> There's and kind of to imp- of impress the family, yeah. right? So, but it sounds like you're you're actually working together super well, and you've been able to bring oh, yeah. this product to market, which has you know, had a massive success so far. So sometimes it's like your best partner is right by you, and you didn't know it all the time, you know? Yeah, oh, totally. exactly, exactly. We could have done this very differently if we hadn't involved these two business partners that Matthew got involved with early on, but we ended up having to take them to court. In fact, they were trying to essentially steal the patent, steal steal the idea. So we spent four years in court and finally, you know, once we got the company back a hundred percent, it's just been moving onwards and upwards from there. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, one of the other things is like as the creator, I think in coming from that creative background, you know, you don't necessarily think that there are people out there that will do that. And it can always be a bit of a rude awakening when that kind of happens in the business world, which is a bit more cold, you know? Oh, definitely. And what do they say, Matt? What was that tagline? If you haven't, oh. <laughs> you haven't been to court, <laughs> If you don't end up in court, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> there, there it is. <laughs> or if someone's not trying to steal your idea, then it's not a good one. No, it's like a rite of passage. When I was early on with my blog, <laughs> I had someone try to sue me for something that I wrote and like I had to get a lawyer involved and and it, and a day it was nothing, right? But you have people who try to yeah. target you when you have something you're onto something, I find. Yeah, yeah, no definitely. I mean, I've even been experiencing that just in the last few weeks during this campaign where people, you know, unfortunately how Kickstarter works is, you know, usually that you offer a, a discount at the very beginning. And then it gradually increases as the campaign goes on. And we've had some people who are really upset about missing the early discounts. And, you know, there's been words there. So you run into all different things during these things and you just have to be open-minded and realize that you can't please everybody. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, you're making it for a select group of people. You're making it for the people who are raving fans, right. And the people who really want to support your work. Um, oh yeah, and the majority of people have been so great and so welcoming, and it's been really fantastic. Yeah. So, so when it comes to the campaign here, I mean, you have this idea, you get a marketing company on the hook, and now you launch this project. Like, did you expect for it to do this well? Was this a surprise to you? Were you planning it? What did you think about that when you finally hit that launch button? <laughs> Oh man, me or Nicole? <laughs> <laughs> Matt, why don't you go first? Definitely, definitely a surprise. Yeah, a good one. Um, oh, it was Matt, like go ahead. <laughs> yeah, like the greatest, greatest day ever. There's yeah, it's hard to explain. There's like three personalities that I, I that I have going on in my mind all the time. Like the really <laughs> cynical one, a really optimistic one, and more maybe a real a realistic one. So I had As each one of those had like yeah different kind of goal that I wanted to reach and different benchmarks when it took off immediately, like actually 10 minutes before it officially launched, we had already we like reached doubled. $10,000 or something at, yeah, before we, we thought we were launching at 7 a.m. And I guess it opens up just a few minutes prior, you know, to get things sorted out on the back end. And we already had 10,000 or we were already at 10,000, our goal. And we were just ecstatic. We're like, oh my God. Well, we were, we were at 25,000 <laughs> in the first 10 minutes before it officially opened. And I'm like, oh there my God. Go. And like, that's crazy. Cause the night before we we're talking, trying to be optimistic. And I'm like, Hey guys, like, this is really bad, like, like self-development work, but I'm like, let's prepare for like a, a mass public failure. So we don't, you know, build up <laughs> yeah. too much. And I'm like in the, the worst case scenario for me is that like, shoot, if we throughout the whole campaign, don't like, you know, get to like $10,000, right. Then we've publicly failed. And like the past 10 years, 10 years yeah. <laughs> and it's like, that's really scary for me. Cause I've put every, I, I literally don't have any kind of a backup thing in life. Like for, as a career, and that's how I like to do things. I like to do things All or nothing. 100%. 
So that that was terrifying. It was just such a relief to be like, oh my gosh. And like that whole 10 years and even the three years before that, when I was coming, before I came up with the idea, you know, that whole buildup in the back of your mind, you're like, am I delusional? Like, is this idea actually worth devoting your entire life and your future and your family's entire money and then your sister's life and her, your sister's future? It's a lot of weight on your shoulders. Yeah. It is. And then you see movies like The Disaster Artist, right? (laughs) And it's like how he's just completely delusional. It's like if you are that delusional, you would never know. And you think you have the greatest idea in the world. But it's like, how do you know if you're actually right? So that, yeah, it's, I think it's natural to have that self doubt and that all just disappeared. Uh, Yeah. yeah. It's almost like these, this, these 10 years and also, the whole legal battles and like all the difficulties you went through, it was all worth it in that short span of time when you realized that you were on to something, you know? Yeah. And we, we did market testing, you know, we prospected the market and everything came back really positive, but it's like still in the back of my mind, I'm like, well, that's not real sales. It's not like real proof, you know? Yeah. You never know until you know. Yeah. Yeah. When when it comes to the the team building aspect, so obviously you know Nicole and Matt, you guys are working well as a team. Did you have any other help? Like, do you have any thoughts on the importance of having a team and assembling that? Oh yeah, yeah. You definitely need a team of people for this. So it's Matt and I first and foremost, and then we've got you know I mentioned Launch Boom, who we hired, and they've been phenomenal, and they've they've helped with every aspect of the campaign. Or else it would have been us trying to navigate that as well as, you know, working with our manufacturer as well as, you know, it's a lot. Quality Um, control, logistics, yeah. If you're worried about the fulfillment and shipping part of your Kickstarter campaign when it comes to getting out all those perks and rewards to your backers, rest assured I've put together a complete Kickstarter fulfillment and shipping checklist for you, and it's free. This is sponsored by the folks at FulfillRight. And they thought that you should have this checklist as part of your arsenal going into a crowdfunding campaign. If you want to get instant access to this checklist and it's free, you can go to fulfillright.com slash checklist. Again, that is F-U-L-F-I-L-L-R-I-T-E dot com slash checklist. Fulfillright.com slash checklist. Just go to that link and you can download it immediately. Oh, yeah. Oh, the shipping. And that's a whole nother story. <laughs> Working out the shipping details. A team of people is really important. So I mentioned Launch Boom, and they've helped us just from the very beginning. And we did a whole, you know, six months. I mean, it turned into a year because of COVID of like a pre launch campaigning and advertising which they all administered. And then we've got Gel Up, who we're also working with, and they've just been phenomenal. And they just they just take your, you know, campaign to the next level. And then we've got some help with our social media. So we've got a team there. And then, you know, I've mentioned the the commenting and emailing and that sort of thing and how overwhelming that can get. So I've got these people helping us as well with some of that because it's coming in from like six or seven different avenues. And it's just, you could spend the first week, I, we were literally at the computer from like 8 a.m. till 11 p.m. Every night, just or every day, just answering comments and questions and mm-hmm. all the and yeah. So yeah. a team of people is very, very important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very yeah. important. The, the trolls, obviously. Where did you learn to do that? Like, do do you have a management background, or is this something you had to learn on the fly? Um. Yeah, I do have a bit of a management background and, and sales. I did work for a company as their asset manager. Um, so I've managed managers. It was in a different industry, real estate, but still the same, you know, the same rules apply. So yeah, yeah, I definitely have the experience there. Very cool. I think that, you know, being able to assemble that team takes a bit of the burden off your shoulders, but also like you're just, you're, you're not good at everything, obviously. So it's really important. One of the other takeaways it looks like is, this pre-launch was really instrumental for getting use of funding early on, right? Oh, it definitely was. It definitely yeah, you have was. to do the pre-launch. Yeah. We collected email addresses. Like I said, so we, we originally planned to launch in May because of COVID. Things were really uncertain. So we put it off and we put it off again. 
So during that entire period, we were collecting email addresses. We were, Launch Boom has a $1 reservation system where people who are really serious and really want to have more of a connection with us as the inventors and that sort of thing. We have a, a $1 reservation that they make and they we bring them to a Facebook VIP group and there we can communicate with them directly and we keep them up to date with all of the process and the progress that's made. So that really helped the VIP group that we we had there and this constant communication over the period of six or nine months. Those were really instrumental in that first day. That was that was the majority of our backers for sure. How did you maintain that level of interest over six to nine months? Because I think most people might tune out, right? How do you maintain that? Yeah, we were a little bit nervous about that for sure. But it was just, again, constant communication. So, and constant advertising. But the communication in the VIP group was very important. Matthew was, yeah, really instrumental in that and always posting photos. People had questions about the different ways the bag functioned and all these sorts of things. And it was just like being there to answer their questions within, I would say, a 12-hour period. And they really appreciated that. Very cool. The other thing Mm -hmm. I think that when it comes to a product like this, you're sharing the photos and stuff like that. Eventually, people are going to be like, what's the price? Like, where can I buy this? How do you Mm. answer those questions? When did you introduce the pricing into the launch? Mm -hmm. I don't think we did that until just weeks prior to launching. We picked up our advertising again and we said, you know, you're going to want to get it on day one because it's a special VIP discount and that sort of thing. But we were careful not to list the price too early. And I think that partly had to do with, you know, things could change. You know, maybe there are additions to your product that, you you know, might change the pricing a little bit and you don't want to, you know, put your foot in your mouth. (laughs) Yeah. You don't (laughs) want to promise something and then change the price later and like that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Hey, Matt, what did it feel like when you're getting all of this great feedback leading up to the launch and people are really loving this product and it was like an idea in your head and then you have it out there and people are reacting to it? Like, how strange is that? Oh, that's like the coolest thing in the world, man. Because like, yeah, you come up with something in your brain and then it's like, it was especially cool because it was like top secret for so many years. Like we had patents and everything, but we didn't want anything leaking out so people can get a head start on copying us. So yeah, it was crazy for it to be top secret. And like me and my people who who, who were were secretly field testing it and everything, you know, we're like looking over our shoulders out in the forest, making sure no one's there. And then like <laughs> whipping it open, using it, blah, 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 and like putting it back and then, you know, looking cash. And it was crazy to transition from that to like putting it onto the market a year ago and just trying to blast it out there and have everyone's like opinions and eyes on it. Yeah. yeah, That was, that was really cool. And to have all like the great comments and especially at first we weren't making the bag look really sexy or like, like a lifestyle bag. We were just pretty much like showing like the bare naked function of the bag. And it was great that people just immediately like picked up on the function and just got it like right away and then started, you know, sharing it and like boasting about it and getting excited. Yeah. It's the coolest thing. I mean, I can see it even change with your marketing. Like now you're really emphasizing the sleek design, the instant access button, water resistant and rain cover. So it sounds like some of that feedback went into the actual, like what you should emphasize as well with the campaign. Yeah. And, oh, and like another thing that will be good for people listening there were things about the bag that I didn't know people would have questions about and concerns. Like when we showed the bag opening up, there's a quick release push button. And I thought that would be really obvious that people could see, but it wasn't. So we immediately saw in our videos like, hey, they're not even like closing the lid. It's just like opening up and it's not being securely closed or whatever. So then I'm like, okay. It we need so to we address these concerns. Our videos. And yeah, immediately we had like a really close up view of the push button and explain that very early. And then those comments completely disappeared. So that's like another good way to, yeah, test the market and see where people are having questions and then changing your, your video or your marketing to answer those questions before people even think about them. 
Definitely. There's almost like an education process with the product a little bit, you know, just showing them what it can do, the functionality, how it works. And the more that they can understand it, you know, it's usually someone when they're like, they don't understand it, they're not willing to buy it. Right. But the second they start to understand the functionality, like, oh, that makes sense. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the other questions I had for you here was like, when it comes to the Kickstarter slump, I call it, where in the middle of the campaign, usually people tend to decrease in their momentum that they had at the beginning. How have you tried to combat that that middle period? And have you maybe not experienced that for your project? I've definitely seen a bit of a lull just in the last three or four days, I would say. So we have been, and we did do this earlier on, but I have been sort of picking up the, sort of getting it out there, but with Kick Booster has been a good tool. Mm. We've had some people jump on Kick Booster, and I noticed that they are getting it out to their networks, and we've had um, some good boosts there. And, and then it just becomes more like, okay, well, who should we, we be reaching out to? So there's a lot of media that we've been reaching out to in the last uh, week or so, trying to get some more attention there and then being really active on Instagram and Facebook and, and that sort of thing. But yeah, there definitely is a bit of a lull. Uh, and we, and we kind of knew this was coming, you know, we we're aware of it at the beginning of this last week, and then it should pick up again, hopefully towards the end. But yeah, there's there's things you can do, but you've just got to be really active and and on top of it. Yeah, so basically make sure to keep engaged and to keep pushing on on all avenues that you have there, particularly mm-hmm. when you're you're in the middle period there. Now that you you know you have about eight days here to go, right? What are your thoughts on like your Kickstarter experience? Are you guys gonna be making more bags? You're gonna be continuing and focusing on this for a while? Like, what are your thoughts on what's next here? Oh, we got a lot of bags coming out. Not sorry, not a lot of bags, but we got yeah. There's there's ideas like it's not just a one thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we our our whole idea the entire time or forever has been to build a brand. Eviscare will be a bag brand, camera bag accessory brand, and we do have nothing in the pipeline just yet. Top the top shelf is our first and the only thing we're focusing on right now. But in the future, we'll definitely be putting out more more stuff do you, do you have gear. advice that, that you would share for people who are kind of in that same position you were where like they're getting ready for the campaign they're not sure how it's going to go they're still in that beginning period do you have any advice for them in terms of either what you wish you did differently or any tips or any other things you'd like to pass on there hmm. Hmm. i would just say that advertising is a really is a really big one. Um, and it, Facebook and Instagram is a really good way of doing that, obviously, these days. So it's it's budgeting for, for advertising. I think advertising is really, really important. I mean, if you don't have a me- way of getting the your project out there in front of people, it's going to be really hard to gain traction during your campaign. Do you have anything to add there, Matt? Yeah, it's a little a little different, but I'd suggest because a lot of people who run Kickstarter campaigns are still in the prototyping stage. Mm, that's right. And there's stuff like after your campaign, if you're still prototyping and working kinks out, there might be a massive kink that actually can't be worked out, and then you're delayed for forever, or you can't even produce it. And that's why Kickstarter has been getting a little bit of a bad name. I think that makes people like really hesitant to invest in your project. So I would highly suggest, you know, even if it's like years in our case to have it, you know, a a perfect market ready product before you do the Kickstarter campaign. Yeah. And that that way also getting all this attention will at least yield really good brand exposure and a good brand experience versus if you get a ton of attention, but you can't deliver, it's going to hurt the brand, you know? That being said, I think, the original idea of Kickstarter was funding people pre-prototyping stage. And that makes a great story too. And you can follow a company from, you know, the grassroots at the very bottom, but there is that. Yeah. If you, if you actually will be able to deliver 
Yeah. Question. Yeah, I think there's going to be both. There's going to be both people, though, right? There's going to be people who need the funding. But, you, you know, you're just very honest in your campaigning and that sort of thing. And if you're honest about that, like, you need the funds to get started. There's going to be those those people and there's nothing wrong with that. You've got to start where you can. But if you are, if you're looking to raise more money to get started, it's good to have your prototype market ready. Well said. Yeah. Well said on the front of like exposure, obviously you got a ton of exposure. You have a ton of backers. Have you had anything else in the way of people reaching out to you for distribution or people wanting to work with you in different ways as a result of the campaign? Well, we get a yes. lot of those, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And it's, again, <laughs> I wish I had another person. <laughs> <laughs> but we've had lots of people reach out and we have worked with or started working with a few. If we're talking about like Instagram and, and collaborations there, we've started to do things like that. But with distribution, I have a number of emails that I need to go through and, and start working through those things on. But it's just been... Yeah, the, it's, like, it's like your business. It's just card been so almost. great. <laughs> yeah, it, it almost like it seems like it turned into your business card to a degree, where like people now see you can execute on this, and they're like, "Oh, okay, I want to get. I'm more interested in what you're doing now." Kind of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When people see the momentum, because you're always going to have this skeptic, and again, that's where the Facebook VIP group has been so great because they've had the direct communication with us. And I feel like we've really gotten to know them and they've gotten to know us. So they feel really secure in backing our project, which is so phenomenal. Totally. So yeah. just for everybody listening, yeah, reach out if you have any questions. We're here to answer them. And yeah, we'd love to hear from anybody. My last question for you, how did your family react to this? And, you know, you guys being able to pull this off together as a duo team, like that just sounds like a great story, you know? Yeah. <laughs> They're all extremely excited, extremely excited for us. That's great. I'm so happy to hear. Yeah, yeah. I love it. That's, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I'm so happy to hear. Where can people go to learn more about the campaign? Look like you still have eight days to go here. Where should they check it out? Yeah, well, definitely Kickstarter. I imagine you could put the URL um, the in description. the podcast yeah. here. Yeah, we've got a website, bevisgear.com. We're on Instagram at bevisgear and Facebook, all sorts of ways. Email, hello at bevisgear.com. Okay, and that's B-E-V-I-S gear.com. You guys can check it out. Yes. Thank you so much for, for coming on the show. Like, really appreciate it. Your story, I think, is is really inspirational. And a lot of the stuff that you shared, I think, also people can act on if they have six months to go or they have time to prepare. I think it really shows, you know, preparation is the mother of success here. And I think you guys clearly demonstrate that. So thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, thank thanks, you so much. Uh, thanks for having us. Hey, thanks for listening to this episode of the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. My name is Salvador Brigman. And man, this was this was a great episode. I know I say that about a lot of these episodes, but like this one in particular to me was sensational. It's like to, to think that someone can have such massive success and also be so humble at the same time, I think is is just awesome. Like that's the kind of person you want to emulate, you know? I hope you took some good stuff away from today's podcast. In the way of, you know, the, the initial question I asked you, which is what is holding you back? What is keeping you from that vision that you have of having a really big campaign, tons of backers, tons of funding? What is holding you back? If you have the answer to that question, I think it'd be great if you could email me. Just go to crowdcrux.com, shoot me an email, go to contact or the about me section. You can reach out to me there. The other thing is when I've asked that question time and time again, one of the number one things is lack of know-how, lack of access to knowing you know, the right tools and, and these kinds of things, how to actually get funding, what to do step-by-step, step, having hand-holding, someone to do it for me, get lots of answers like that from previous students and previous listeners of this podcast. So thinking about that, there are a few different ways I think that I can help. Well, first is Kickstarter Launch Formula is an incredible book. You can go and check that out on Audible at crowdcrux.com slash kickstarter audio. Number two, 
if you're just looking for kind of like a, a great feed just to keep at the top of your mind of how to get funding and the tactics that are working, go and check out my newsletter, crowdcrux.com slash newsletter. That's a really great place to get started. And you can just kind of download some of the stuff in your head and just keep an eye out, right? If you want to kind of go a little bit deeper and like you're willing to invest in your journey, in the journey that's going from point A to point B, point A being I'm here now, I have an idea, maybe I have a prototype and like I'm trying to get this thing out there and I want to get funding and I want to get backers, I want to get validation, I want to get traffic, I want to do marketing, like all that stuff. We'd love to have some customers as well, obviously, and have people hold this product in their hands and use it, right? Get feedback. I think if that's something that you aspire to, what I'm about to mention can really have a profound impact on your campaign. And when I've ever had like opportunities or I've experienced any kind of small success, there's a saying that great opportunities have people attached to them. And I found that to be so true, man. I found it to be so true in my life. Every opportunity that I've had or every kind of like way I've leveled up in my life has always had people attached to it, either meeting the right people, right, in terms of my teammates or getting access to the right knowledge through someone else and learning from that person. Opportunities always have people attached to them. And this is kind of like one of the kernels of truth that led me to start my mastermind community. The mastermind community is meant to be an insiders group within my crowd crux community. And it's really for only the most dedicated, hardcore people that are taking action and that want results. If you're one of those types of people that want results, then you should listen up because I'm going to share with you kind of what you know goes into this community. So first of all, it's meant to be a learning environment. So I'm regularly sharing downloadable blueprints, checklists, to do items, everything that goes into a successful Kickstarter campaign. You can just kind of copy and implement. For those people out there that don't just want to copy, they want to also learn. I also do weekly workshops within this community to share with you different core principles as it relates to launching your campaign. You can kind of think of it almost as like a, a curriculum, like a syllabus, and you get to ask questions and it's a group learning environment. So you're kind of a part of this class. You can also book one-on-one -on -one calls with me. You can also get access to my team. And you can also post your work for critiques if you want to. And you can kind of decide how much you want to use this resource, which is available to you, this bedrock, which you can lean on as a foundation, right? Going into your project. And I'll be honest with you, to me, if you launch a successful campaign and you're willing to credit in any way, me or the community, I think with having helped you get there, I consider that to be success. In my eyes, that's success when a student says, you know, you helped this help make this happen. That to me is like so rewarding. And it's the whole reason why I love doing coaching and I love putting out teachings. I love making courses. I love, you know, doing all this in the podcast. So if that happens, like that would be like, so maybe so happy having those types of testimonials. That's at the end of the day, what I, what I work for and what I enjoy doing. So if that sounds interesting to you, you just want to learn a tiny bit more about this, you can go to crowdcrux.com slash mastermind. That link is C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X.com slash mastermind, crowdcrux.com slash mastermind. Thank you for joining me. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. I'll see you next time, and I hope you have a great week.